I welcome you to to our open new lecture series, which is a, on a usual unusual day, Thursday. We usually have these on Fridays, but uh, this is kind of an, an intro to uh, our big symposium all day tomorrow, Hoverflow Mind Flight, which is going to be held in another location of the IAA. It's going to be in Threlhot. So please take note of that. But and all, you should all come, it's going to be great. Uh, about Michael Biggs, he is uh, a professor of aesthetics and a former associate dean of research at the University of Hertfordshire. So he has a, a long-standing uh, experience with research in the arts and design and actually in, in, in a variety all of All the creative areas, really. All the really. creative yeah. areas. Uh, 25 years he's been looking into these uh, matters and he's been publishing widely and, 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 and consistently throughout these years. Uh, a very welcome to you. Thank you. And Thank you. we look forward to your talk on what can practice tell us about knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you for the, the invitation and the opportunity to be here. Um, I've deliberately set up a kind of uh, polarity in my title. What can practice tell us about knowledge? I've even given you a clue by italicizing what I think are some key words here. What can this tell us about that? And why did I <clears throat> want to set it up like that? Well, I think there are some implications in the way we use some of these words and when we use them. Because I think this one over here, practice, <clears throat> is something we're used to in, in the art school, as artists, as creative practitioners, we're used to the idea that we do things, that we, that we make things. And there's the world of professional practice over here, careers as artists, exhibiting galleries, performing in music spaces, and, and so on, whatever is appropriate. I want to try to use language that involves, that includes uh, visual art, music, architecture, all of these things because I think they're all in a, a similar situation. Whether or not they're in the same school or faculty, I think they're in a similar situation in relation to practice and all that that implies on the one hand, and this alternative over here, knowledge. <clears throat> and this one I think brings with it some different connotations. It brings with it connotations of thinking and reflecting sitting still, doing things with your eyes closed instead of with your eyes open. And of course, I think we could also think that this is what happens in the professional world, this is what happens in academia. So there's potentially a bit of a divide here between the, the artists who actually you know, earn a living and exhibit things and the people who are studying it. And to some extent, perhaps, academicizing what's going on. Maybe you don't need any of that to do that. So you don't need to do any of that to increase knowledge. That's the kind of area that I want to explore with you. And somewhere in here, I think, there's an implied bridge. Because in Britain, and elsewhere in, in Europe as well, you can encounter a concept called practice-based research, and there are variations on this, practice-led research, artistic research, and so on. But this particular way of writing it down, practice-based research, implies that maybe there's something we could do, some special kind of practice that we could do, that would result in increases in knowledge on this side, that would bring some of these communities together. Well, maybe that's what we should be doing when we're encouraged to do research in creative areas like art and design and architecture and so on. So that's where I'm coming from and the reason that I think I got pushed into this is because my um, School of Creative Arts is a faculty within a university that teaches all sorts of other subjects. 
So, for a long time, I have had to account for what the people were doing in the School of Art and Design to people like physicists and sociologists and so on at university level meetings where, where the different <coughs> departments come together. And that's been a very interesting experience to try to uh, describe in ways that are recognisable to other people what the, how the practices that go on in the School of Art and Design, School of Art, um, contribute knowledge in ways that would be recognisable as research to people who are not themselves artists. So I've said that I think that this, um, phrasing it this way, uh, plays to some preconceptions, but I don't think they're just preconceptions about professional practice on the one hand and academia on the other. I think they are historically rooted. So I wanted to just say uh, a little bit about the, where I think some of these problems come from. When the universities were established, uh, sorry, a little bit boring here, in the 13th century, when the universities were established, I think this is the, really what they were thinking about when they talked about knowledge. This is, I can't remember whether this is Aristotle or Plato, I think it's Aristotle. Um, but, you know, he's thinking hard. This, this is what you do in the university, preferably with your eyes shut. Uh, it goes on up here. It doesn't go on here. Um, Descartes, famously, you know, when, when he wanted to really get to the fundamental truths, the things that could be certain and known, he sat in a darkened room. So the more you can withdraw from the ugly world of sensation and the dirty materiality of life, the more you are going to get close to knowledge. Knowledge in the sense of truth, wisdom, certainty. This is the kind of academic model. But strangely enough, when the universities were established, the principal subject that you would study in university was theology. Which is not really how I think we, we now come to it. I guess now, if we have some kind of traditionally <coughs> based uh, preconception about subjects that are obviously university subjects and subjects that maybe should be somewhere else, we think more about the hard sciences, so we think about that kind of activity rather than uh, something, a uh, humanities discipline, uh, humanities like discipline, such as theology. But anyway, I think we've inherited this model, and of course the, the Plato developed a whole theory whereby artists were the worst possible people you could ever have dealings with, and that the more you retreated into a kind of intellectual reflection uh, on what you knew of the world, the closer you were going to get to certainty. And the reason that he thought that was he was very aware that the information that comes to us through our senses is often illusory. We can be fooled by our senses. So obviously the senses are not to be trusted. And if we really want to get to knowledge, then we have to use the power of the mind to overcome all of this distraction of the senses. Now fortunately, from our point of view, <coughs> scooting on a couple of hundred years, we get the Enlightenment, where empirical reality the experience of the world started to become more useful. And this is the birth, of course, of the scientific method, this idea that you don't just sit in a darkened room with your eyes closed and think very hard, but you observe what's going on in the world. You perhaps conduct some experiments. Um, this is Newton. Uh, and you can't really see it in that slide. He's got his eyes open. And although he's looking down, He's looking at something. He's actually doing a drawing. So he's using a tool. He's doing an activity. He's making a calculation of some kind, but he's observing the results. He's paying attention <clears throat> to what's happening in the material world. So the, the, the sequence I'm inviting you to observe is that we have got an increased amount of impact from the physical world evidence 
for what is being thought about. And it starts to connect um, the knowledge that we have actually to the material world. And science has progressed with a focus on the materiality. Uh, a little bit later on, I'm going to mention the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. You know, this big circular scientific experiment that costs a lot of money and looks at extremely small things. But nonetheless, it's basically a materialist approach to investigating our world, albeit that it's looking at very small bits of material. What I quite like about this slide is that we see emerging some other forms of knowledge that people sitting around the sculpture are doing a variety of things, lying on their back and looking at the sky, uh, talking to somebody else on the phone. These are also models, contemporary models, that we have of where knowledge can come from. I think we, we don't just have this idealised view, scientific view, that a special kind of exposure to um, empirical reality coupled with a special kind of thinking about it will result in knowledge. We understand that communicating with other people will generate knowledge, that there are forms of knowledge that we might say are social and reside in groups rather than in individuals, uh, that we might understand something about human beings by thinking about their dreams, their daydreams or their night dreams. So with increasing amounts of um, evidence and, and the engagements of the, uh, the empirical world and our, the role that our senses play in what we know changes our view of the world, what knowledge is, where we might go to get more of it. So if we think that perhaps something like this it is a model of artistic knowledge. What does that tell us about what we mean by knowledge? We meant something up here. Plato meant something about knowledge that had nothing at all to do with material reality. Newton meant something by knowledge that was perhaps empirically grounded. But what about Tracy Emin? What what does that tell us about what we now think is the content of the world that we might know of? <clears throat> A key part of this transition from a kind of platonic idea and a Newtonian idea and an Eminian idea, I don't know what we call Tracy Emin's idea, an artistic view of the world, is about what we regard as evidence <coughs> for what we're doing. Evidence on which we ground <coughs> our knowledge. But the notion of evidence is a bit complex. If we take the, the courtroom as a contemporary manifestation of where ideas of evidence and knowledge are argued over on a regular basis in public, we can see that evidence has got a very particular role. And what intrigues me about <coughs> the courtroom notion of evidence, so what we would point at in order to justify the knowledge that we've got, the beliefs that we've got, is that exactly the same evidence is used in the courtroom to support both the prosecution account and the defence account. I don't know how it goes in Iceland, but in Britain, it's a legal requirement when you have a trial that you state everything that you're going to use as evidence. And both sides have access to it. And once you've made a list of the things that are going to be produced in court, like a bloodstained knife and a you know, an email or a telephone record, you can't then change that. So what I conclude from that <coughs> is that evidence is not simply the proof of our ideas. We can't simply say, I believe so-and-so. Mm -hmm. this, this artistic project is, mm -hmm. is, is about X, and here is the evidence. Because we can use the evidence to be for a case 
or against a case. In other words, the prosecution build one narrative around evidence, and the defence build an entirely opposite, not just different, but an entirely opposite story around the same evidence. <coughs> so we have a problem in kind of theory of knowledge. What are we going to use as evidence? What's going to count? What are we going to declare? And how are we going to use it? How is that part of a bigger narrative? And it's the narrative that begins to construct knowledge. Not just what we point to, but what we say about it, or perhaps internally what we think about it, how we reflect upon it. And what we conclude, who, who done it? There is according to this story that we tell. We shift the focus onto particular pieces of evidence. We, we make different causal connections. And the culprit in our crime, who is the, the artist? What is the knowledge that's produced? Uh, varies according to the narrative that we tell. If you wanted an example of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Can't remember the date, but anyway, pre Copernicus, the Earth was thought to be the centre of the universe. So in manuscripts of the time, you can find these sorts of diagrams featuring the planetary sphere, the orbits of the planets arranged in these nice concentric <coughs> circles with Earth in the centre. And of course the reason that they thought Earth was in the centre was because from this Earth, Earth-ocentric position we, we see the sun rising and it moves across the sky and it sets over there and various things move around the sky. We feel as though we're standing still and you know, common sense, if you like, tells us that everything else is moving around us. So we're the fixed point and everything else moves. And this was fine for hundreds of years until it was required that this knowledge of what the solar system was like, this um, account, this explanation, it was difficult to accommodate within this explanation some kinds of uh, planetary movement, particularly comets. So it could explain it so far. You know, it was fine if all you wanted to do was account for why does the sun appear to rise there and, and set there. But it didn't do the whole job. So it was replaced by a system in which the sun was the centre of the universe. Looks remarkably similar. So there's, a, there's a, a change in conception, but the basic kind of structure stays the same. And I guess we're reasonably happy with this explanation of things. We perhaps think this one is truer than this one. Maybe we think this is what reality is like, and these guys were simply wrong. But what, what are we going to change next? How small do we have to go, or how big do we have to go, before this explanation doesn't really account for everything? This suits us fine while we're talking about all of the planets, all of the comets, absolutely all of the meteors. But maybe it doesn't help us very much when we're talking about something subatomic or when we're talking about something uh, intergalactic. I don't know what the limits of this model are. But it, what I'm trying to um, put across here is that <clears throat> we create narratives. Using evidence, we create narratives that enable us to claim that we know something. We know how, why the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. We know why <coughs> comets appear to travel across the sky. <coughs> and it's based on a model that for the moment works, but we have no idea whether one model is truer than another. They get replaced periodically. They get replaced by opposites, like this one. So some of the changes that we go through with what are apparent, in this case, scientific certainties, are very dramatic. 
And perhaps artistic research is going to enable us to open different windows. But as soon as we open a different window, we're able to see reality differently. We're able to understand it differently. We see different things. We observe phenomena that we didn't even observe before. So it's very powerful what framework you think you're in. And we have to understand that we get to a limit where our explanation is no longer satisfactory. It stops us talking about knowledge as being certain or explanatory frameworks as being very fixed and allows us to think that knowledge actually changes. Knowledge isn't about certainty. It's something much more pragmatic than that. It allows us to understand something. It allows us to explain something for the time being. <coughs> Apparently creationists think that fossils are put in the, into the earth by Satan in order to test our, our belief in God's creation. Most of the Western world uh, thinks that this isn't what fossils are, but that fossils are the remnants of creatures that lived millions of years ago and whose remains have been turned into stone. Well, actually, I think, I think that's an equally incredible thing to claim, isn't it? I mean, do we really believe that as well? We use that just as a, as a framework for the time being. And I think uh, we'll soon come to a point where we don't describe fossils in that kind of way at all. We find that equally unsatisfactory as an explanation. So knowledge creation is a kind of uh, process. It's a selective process in which we choose, first of all, to have a kind of overarching concept, and then to describe particular features. Oh, well, of course... It's made of stone because, you know, it's no longer a little shellfish because. And we've got lots of clever answers to these because questions. But it's selective. I guess there are other features that we choose to ignore. <clears throat> we can see this at work, even in apparently very um, well-considered scientific models of research and knowledge production. So I'm moving towards art, but just for the moment I'm going, talking about a, a prejudice we might have that there is a branch of knowledge in which it's all certain and that there are well worked out rules about how you would contribute to that knowledge through academic or scientific research. And I'm trying to suggest to you that's nonsense uh, there are large branches of, of the theory of knowledge that question that, and you don't have to look very closely at what scientists and other apparently reputable people are doing to see lots of holes in it. <clears throat> so we have forms of mathematical modelling. Uh, this one happens to be about DNA, but it doesn't really matter. So we represent the information that we've got in particular ways that reveal certain characteristics and correspondingly perhaps hide others. So it is a rhetorical process <coughs> how you present information. The little diagram that you draw, how big you make it, what colour it is, how sexy it looks, is all part of persuading people that DNA is like this and not like something else. You know this double helix model. It's nice, isn't it? It's memorable. It's not an accident that somebody found that was a persuasive way of communicating uh, genetic structure. It doesn't mean that's how it really is. And a very obvious case of that is something that I think we've probably all done when we were at school. I don't know whether you, you had this experience, but when I did physics experiments at school, so you set up the apparatus, you do <coughs> what you're supposed to do, and you plot the results on a graph. Yeah, you don't have to cross, 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 cross. And the teacher says, and draw the straight line that connects all of these points together. Well, my points never connected together in a straight line. They were scattered all over the place. And the truth is that there is no straight line in science. 
nobody's results all line up in a little straight line. It's an approximation of a straight line. Yeah? An average. What, what does that process mean? You mean we don't have to pay attention anymore to the reality of what we found in the experiment, <clears throat> and what we do instead is construct an artificial line that doesn't actually hit any of the points at all. Isn't this simply a lie? This is imaginary, but it's useful. It's more useful if we can pretend that everything lined up, because we can say something about the average, about general conditions instead of specific conditions. We can get away from individual cases <clears throat> and talk about generalization. That helps us transfer what we know over here into the problem that we've got over there. And that's what it's about. It's about being productive. It's about being useful. It's not about being right. <clears throat> What's the effect of that? The effect of that is that we, either we're trained, or we're indoctrinated, or if you prefer, we are enabled to see connections and usefulness in data that would otherwise, data and evidence, that would otherwise be too complicated to handle. So we turn it into something useful, we turn it into a tool. We turn it into something we want, because we've actually got an objective to achieve something, to solve a problem, to make something happen. And it focuses our attention on particular aspects, on the kind of things that were being measured in our little graph, and not on some other aspects of the phenomenon. And when you do the physics experiment in the, in the classroom at school, you don't generally concern yourself about whether the equipment's made of wood or plastic, you know, whether the the wire was shiny or not. And the, it, there are all sorts of phenomenological, uh, phenomenological content here, but we focus on a particular aspect of what's happening at the expense of other things. What did I want to say about that? <coughs> I mentioned the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. This is a huge research project. It ought to provide us with a model of a successful research application. I mean, I'm dead jealous. I spend a lot of time bidding for, for research money. It's usually less than a million pounds. The biggest is that kind of amount. Sometimes it's you know, 100,000 pounds. But these guys in, in Switzerland, they have just spent seven and a half billion euros on this piece of equipment. It took something like 10 years to build. They used it for three years. They found the smallest thing you could possibly imagine, and now they want to make a new one of these bits of equipment so they can search for something even smaller. So a seven and a half billion euro project to find something you couldn't see if you dropped it on the floor, and uh, they're now sort of not satisfied with this piece of equipment. That's very impressive. I'm impressed by that, and I'm dead jealous, I admit it. They obviously know how to write a research proposal. <laughs> And the other thing is, not only do they, are they good at writing research proposals, but they've got the whole world watching TV and saying, hooray, they found the Higgs boson. <clears throat> the what? Anyway, they, they, it's part of a cultural nexus, is I guess where I'm going here, that scientific research, we've got a bit of an idea what scientific research is, we trust the scientific researchers, we think that although sometimes it sounds as though they are um, doing rather erudite and, and abstract things, it filters down into um, smartphones and, and faster computers and things like that that, that are, have everyday benefits. <coughs> and the connection here, I think, is that this 
model of scientific inquiry is still a very material. The scientists, in this case, are looking for smaller and smaller and smaller bits of material reality, particles, things, so that when you recombine them, or recombine what they do, you can make material goods for people like us to enjoy, like smartphones and faster computers. So we see a kind of rationale and a bit of a, an interest in what they're doing. There's going to be something in this for me, eventually, some piece of technology that I'm going to think is great and enjoy using, or will save me money, and that's why these guys in Switzerland are spending a lot of money. In the end, I get it back. But it's a very material concept of how we would want to increase knowledge. Because <coughs> it tells us nothing, it doesn't contribute to anything that we know about human disease, for example. It might do. But it certainly doesn't tell us um, which side of a political conflict we should back. How we can improve the quality of life of people on Earth. The kind of platonic questions that were asked in the ancient world. How do we make life better? How do we make something good? None of this money that's, going, that's being spent in Switzerland helps us to save the children, save lives, stop war. So it's very, very selective. A selective idea that I think we've inherited over this long period that research and academic knowledge is about a particular slice of human activity, almost independent of everything else, and we should spend money on this and it's worthwhile. That's not a political outcome. Um, well, I was going to put it in, in uh, context. I said it's seven and a half billion pounds, uh, sorry, euros, seven and a half billion euros spent on the Large Hadron Collider. Well, the cost of the war in Iraq was 200 billion. So that was actually much more expensive. So in terms of spending money, it's much cheaper to build a Large Hadron Collider. So perhaps we should say yes to the next generation because it's a budget bit of expenditure. <coughs> So we've got the idea that, that um, research is a selective process and in certain areas we actually select out of all of the types of human activity that there are a certain range, a scientific range, that we're going to spend money on. So that means that we're not extending this concept of knowledge into really the majority of the rest of human existence where of course we will find art. And I want to try and go back to, to this sort of this terminology, this idea of practice and knowledge. It seems to me that knowledge, the things that we know, the ideas that we have, are not just these abstract intellectual things. They are embodied. We embody them in how we are and how we present ourselves to the world. And they form us. They feed back to us and create the people that we are. So what we know is very much mediated by what we do and how we do it. And it's a completely false idea the false idea that belongs to the role of evidence in the courtroom, that there's one certain core that we can appeal to. So when we pick up the sort of researchy type words, we're quite accustomed, I think, to the way in which methods and interpretational frameworks 
point to different elements within the world, different things to do with evidence, different views of reality. But what I want to overlay onto this is something prior to all of that. That prior to our ability to, to know something from a particular point of view, to argue for it from a particular point of view, to argue against somebody else's alternative point of view, before we can even get into that position, we need to decide on which of these two guys we are here. What is our, where are we located in relation to what it is that we're looking at? And how does that affect the way in which we undertake our interpretation? So I'm turning knowledge into something much more active that we do. We literally stand in relation to something. We, we expose ourselves to art exhibitions. We listen to music. We read certain books. These are all things that influence what we will see, what the world looks like to us when we open our eyes. Is it a place where we have to stand up for ourselves that's you know, largely uh, full of conflict? Or is it something where we're going, we're going to encounter harmony, spread harmony? These are, these are two alternative attitudes that come before these guys even say or think anything. This is a kind of psychoanalysis of knowledge, really. <clears throat> so I guess what I'm claiming is that this is a somewhat underestimated side of the research activity. And that if you arrive with the assumption that scientific research is indeed the paradigm and that any other kind of research should be following that as much as possible, <clears throat> then you are going to end up finding Higgs boson particles rather than um, contributing to techniques that stop uh, warfare or uh, disease. And I guess one of the questions is, well, what kind of attitude would an artistic attitude bring? If we start off as artists and then think what happens when we look at issues of post-colonialism and our, our view on reality and what we see as data that could be used as part of a post-colonialist project, as artists, what does that look like in contrast, perhaps, to being a scientist or being a sociologist? And there, I mean, I haven't really mentioned any other kind of intellectual landmarks so far. So I wanted to connect it to three concepts. I'm going to draw three concepts, which I think are related to the kind of thing that I'm talking about, related to this idea that knowing is a practice and it comes from us as embodied human beings bringing certain preconceptions to bear before we even start thinking about the issue. First one comes from Wittgenstein, <coughs> who coined this idea of seeing as. And his little, he had a number of little examples, but one of them was a figure that looked like a, an arrow, three lines like this, joined at a point. And he said, that can look like an arrow pointing to the left, or it can look like a little bird's footprint that seems to be walking to the right. And seeing as crops up when you ask somebody to talk about an image like that. And the way that they talk about it reveals whether, in the back of their mind, they have really seen this as an arrow, or they have really seen it as a little footprint. And he thought that that was a metaphor for how we understand concepts. That we perhaps see research this isn't his example now, this is mine. We see a concept like research as being based on a scientific paradigm. So when we do research, when we reach for the things that we would need in order to do a research project, it reveals that we have fundamentally in the back of our mind, perhaps unconsciously even, a notion that research is, of a, particular, is a particular kind of activity. And maybe as an artist, you reach for you know, a paintbrush instead of a 
bit of scientific equipment. That also reveals, ah, so you think it's going to be this kind of activity. You think it's going to involve image making. It's all, it's all reveals, a bit like psychoanalysis, reveals the assumptions you have about what it is you think you're doing when you're doing research. So I think there's a, an issue of seeing as a work where we can observe how people approach undertaking artistic research. We can see it as a symptom of their underlying belief about what they think the activity of research is in the first place. <coughs> and acting as, acting as is a kind of my uh, derivation from activity theory, this idea that we construct the world by relating to it in particular ways. We, we uh, uh, socially, we undertake activities, and this creates the world that we see around us. We can describe scientific research because we've read certain books, because we behave in certain ways as a society, we spend money in certain ways at a national level, and all of this creates the, uh, and makes visible a category of activity called scientific research. Now, if we behave in different ways, if our society is organised in a different way, that activity might not be very visible to us. Some other activity might be more visible a little bit like I was critical of saying that scientific research spends a lot of time and energy and expertise in finding tiny material particles instead of solving world hunger. Okay, but that's, a, that's a choice. We embody it in a particular way. We've made it like that. <clears throat> so the first one is a kind of psychological description. That how we frame things comes from how we think about them in our own heads. The second one is a kind of social description. How we find things, what we think research is, is based on the way that we organise society. We have something called the Iceland Academy of Art, and that creates a category of artist research. And that's where we look if we want to know more about what artistic research is. And then we've got the notion of uh, habitus and practice from Bourdieu, who talk about... <clears throat> classes of people who control our perception of professional activity. So, being a doctor, for example, is not just knowing about medicine. It's about behaving in a certain way, not necessarily a way that is socially agreed, like the social agreement that was required to establish the Iceland Academy of Arts. That's a collective thing, all the taxpayers together, all of the voters, we might say, some kind of democratic decision. Habitus isn't a democratic decision. Habitus is a, a kind of oligarchic um, uh, decision where those possessed of uh, an authority within medicine set up a, a kind of personal model, a role model, if you like, for what it is to be a doctor. And if you aspire to be a doctor, you don't only have to learn about medicine, you have to walk the walk, you don't just talk the talk, you have to adopt <coughs> all sorts of things that are not directly linked to the practice of medicine in order to be uh, accepted as authorised to practice medicine. So there I think we, we perhaps could map that onto what happens to you as students in an institute like this, with evil people like the rector get her hands on you and corrupt you and force you to think in certain ways because she knows what the professional activity of research and the professional activity of art is. And so it's not just doing your own thing. It's about doing it in ways that are likely to be recognised by others as, oh, that person's an artist, not just a nutcase. <coughs> okay, nearly at the end. So, this quote keeps our attention on the right target, I think. The object of knowledge is practical. It's 
practical in the sense that it depends upon a specific kind of practice for its existence. So none of this knowledge just happens on its own. It's all in some kind of uh, mediated context of activities done either by, the, by you or by a group of your professional peers or by the society, the local society in, in which you are working, like in Reykjavik or something like that, or Iceland, or at, at some level in humanity. <coughs> It's very much a practice. And I want to say that all research is based in practices. Practices with an S on them. All research comes out of a process of doing, not this process of thinking with your eyes shut. So all research is closely linked to the kind of thing that artists normally do. Artists are aware that they are involved with practices and perhaps feel that research is almost the opposite to that. But I'm saying no. Research is grounded very much in practices, in things that you do. So I think this term practice-based research should not be about the practices themselves, <coughs> but about how these practices determine or fit our perceptions of the world and what we need to know about it. So, just to unpack that last little bit, it's not that practice-based research represents a method. That you learn how to do practice-based research, and then that enables you to do research in the art environment, in the creative environment. I'm saying that practice-based research should be focusing our attention on the instrumental role the practices that we do, whatever they are, and the way in which that constructs the reality that we're pointing to. So practice-based research is about asking yourself, why am, I, why am I doing this? Why am I doing it this way? How does that affect my understanding of what is the issue that I'm addressing, and how does it influence the range of possible outcomes I might have as a result of this practice. So it's being critical of that, what I'm saying is instrumental role that the practices that you choose have or what it is that you achieve. That's it. I'm open to questions. <clears throat>